Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Happy Swan Day. My name is Terry Lawler, and I am the executive director of New York Women in Film and Television. For those of you who don't know, New York Women in Film and Television is a professional association of women in film, television, and digital media. We have 2,000 members in the New York City area, and we're part of a network of 40 women in film chapters with 10,000 members around the world. Um, we have been celebrating Swan Day for, I just don't know, but maybe the next speak, nine years. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and we're really delighted because we have a, a, lot, of, uh, mem a lot of partners in this endeavor, and, and even a new partner this year. Um, first of all, I want to thank the School of Visual Arts for donating this beautiful theater. And I want to thank SAG-AFTRA, uh, who is hosting the reception, which will follow. Um, and I want to thank some of our other partners, um, the Coalition for Women in Arts and Media, Herflix, African American Women in Cinema, and Women Make Movies. Um, so, I want to introduce you to, introduce you to a few of our partners, and, but before we get to that, I want to introduce you to the woman who started this whole thing. And her name is Jan Hutner. Jan? This is um, such a thrill. I know it's the ninth annual Swan Day because I've been sweating this out every year. This is my fourth year here in New York and it is such a thrill um, to be with all of you, to be with NYWITH and SAG-AFTRA, Women in Media, and now to have African American women in cinema, to um, have intersectionality and diversity and, uh, <laughs> and support women artists now. Um, before I go, I'd like to thank our two newest interns at FF2 Media, Amelie and Tracy, from Columbia University. They are the people that were passing out all the stickers today. And there are swan pins at each end, so you can take as many as you like before you go and get ready for the 10th annual Swan Day in 2017. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jan. Um, our next, next speaker is from SAG-AFTRA, and her name is Leslie Shreve. Happy Swan Day, everybody. Hello. Hi. Well, you know, Swan Day is very important to SAG-AFTRA. Uh, four years ago, this was the first group that we got to announce that the two great unions, Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, merged into, into SAG-AFTRA. As many of you probably know, um, the first president of SAG-AFTRA was a champion of this merger, and his name was Ken Howard. <coughs> yes, and as some of you do know, he did pass away this week. So this is a little odd, I know, but I'm just wondering, do you think that we could vote to maybe dedicate this Swan Day here in New York City to his memory? Everybody that wants to raise your hand. <sighs> Everybody who doesn't want to? <laughs> oh, so can I tell them that it was unanimous from this body? Yes! Thank you. <laughs> he did support women artists now very mightily. So now that we did this, let me just also confide in you that there is a memorial wall for his wife, Linda, who was a stunt woman, for his family and his SAG-AFTRA family and his industry family. Our wonderful staffer from SAG-AFTRA's diversity department, Becky Curran. Where are you, Becky? There she is. <laughs> oh, there she is. OK, somebody else waved, too. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Becky's right here. She, uh, there is going to be a, um, a memorial wall. We are going to probably put the, uh, from our groups that, that this is dedicated to Ken. But I would like to raise a lot of noise for this. So if you want to uh, go out and get the, it's, it's Farewell Ken at SAGAFTRA.org. Becky brought some, some um, signs with that. If you wanted to write on this wall, mention your name, mention Swan Day, New York, your city, and mention Ken, that we are honoring Ken, and anything else you want to do. That would be such a great 
a, a great tribute to, to this great man who was so proud of the work we did in New York, and he will be missed. Now, on to the networking uh, session. You know, SAG-AFTRA is sponsoring this. How many people are actually SAG-AFTRA members in here? Ladies and gentlemen, you creative types, you writers, you directors, you producers, look at the diversity we are bringing to you today here at Swan Day. During this networking uh, session, why not go find a performer that may be good for your next project or the project after that and talk to them and maybe that make this a Swan Day success. That would be great for all of us. I thank you so much for your kindness. I thank you for making the wall in Ken's name bloom with New Yorkers, and I wish you a wonderful Swan Day. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce um, our speaker from the uh, Women in Arts and Media Coalition. Um, we've been part of this coalition for tw 20 years. And um, have, we do a lot of a lot of events. It's a coalition. Well, I'll let I'll let Shellen tell you about that. So um, anyway, it's a wonderful organization. They are one of our original par original partners here on Swan Day. And let me introduce to you Shellen Lupin. Thank you so much. I am co-president of the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition with Leslie Shreve, who represents SAG-AFTRA. And uh, I represent the League of Professional Theater Women, though we are both members of quite another, quite a number of the member organizations of our coalition. And in fact, here today, how many of you were SAG-AFTRA? How many of you are NYWIFT or are affiliated? Oh, yeah. And um, how many of you are in some way affiliated with Women Make Movies? Well, whether or not you know it, you are a member of the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition because your organizations are a member of the coalition. We have a number of coalition board members here. Would you raise your hands? Note these people if you have questions and want to find out more about it. We will also have um, some sheets to sign up for our mailing list and to volunteer because our goal for this year, for 2016, is to get the reach out to all of our organizations, to new organizations. We would love to have African-American women in cinema. How many of you are from African-American? We got to talk, because like you should be a member of this coalition. We are a member of so many different unions, guilds, and smaller organizations like Women Make Movies, like Women's Media Center, who, uh, are, at, and who are in arts, media, that includes theater, music, dance, and we are all working together to very, very much catapult this mission that we all share, which is to get women more work, to get women more money, to get women more visibility, and to expand the range of what we understand women to be and what women can do. So join with us. We'll talk later. And we are very happy this year to welcome African American women in cinema to our uh, Swan Day partnership. And this is also the last day of their festival, I believe, and they've had an incredible festival. And I will let, let me introduce you to Renee, Tara Renee, who will uh, tell you a little bit more about what's going on with African American women in cinema. Good afternoon. Wow, what a beautiful, lovely crowd. You're gorgeous. <laughs> um, thank you so, so very much. Uh, as uh, Terry had made mention, uh, this is the, we're sharing our closing or par in partnership with uh, New York Women in Film and Television, uh, S Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, School of Visual Arts, and also the Women in the Arts Coalition. Uh, honoring Swan Day, and we are so, so excited. We had a wonderful week with the opening of the Urban Movie Channel uh, film called The Sincere, and then we had incredible panels, film financing by Morgan Stanley, as well as the governor's office participating, uh, showcasing and talking to us about tax credit and the benefits of shooting in New York. So we're, this is a wonderful way to wrap up, and such a special thanks to Terry Lawler. 
Dwana Butler, <laughs> to all of our sponsors and supporters who came aboard and, know, and felt and saw our vision of participating in the film festivals, our 18th year of celebrating. There are a couple of our sponsors who are here. I just want to give a quick shout out. Uh, Multimedia Cultural Center, which it was founded by Mr. Bill McCrary and is headed up by Kim Fuller, uh, Ms. Yolanda McIntosh, also from the Anya Film Group, uh, Mr. Mikey J. And also to our staff, our wonderful volunteers, and our interns. But also special thanks to our festival producer, Ms. Lamonia Brown. <laughs> Big round. <laughs> She really, she called me, she said, we have to, have to make sure we make this uh, part of the festival, and I could not agree with her more. This year, we had a wonderful addition. Uh, we decided to have an ambassador for this year, and the ambassador name is Miss Princess Films. Miss Princess, wave your hand so everyone can see you. Princess is, she's an alumni. She did a feature film that was produced by Taraji P. Henson. You all know her from Empire. And she's on doing some incredible things and working with us, so we're very happy about that. Uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Amadou, who's been by my side, and my family member, Pete. So without further ado, thank you all so very much. Thank you again, Terry. Thank you, New York Women in Film and Television. We look forward to continue this partnership. So um, we are going to start the movie now, and uh, after the movie, we're going to have a Q&A uh, moderated by Michelle Mater, who's a, who is a NYWIFT member and a, a very important uh, programmer and academic in our community. And um, she will be talking with one of the producers of the film, Sabrina Schmidt-Gordon. So we're going to show the film now, and then we'll have our talk after, and then we'll have our reception. Hi, I'm back, and thank you, everyone. This was a wonderful, wonderful film. I so enjoyed <laughs> watching it. And uh, I wanted, uh, so we have here um, Sabrina Schmidt-Gordon, who has, uh, who is one of the filmmakers and has been uh, producing and editing high-impact documentaries for more than 15 years. And moderating the discussion with Sabrina is Michelle Mater. And Michelle Mater <laughs> is a, a runs a film series called Creatively Speaking that has been touring that has been a forum for presenting works by and about women and people of color for 20 years. And uh, she is also a professor at the New School. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, and she is a features, uh, I'm sorry, and she's a member of the Board of Directors of Women Make Movies, a former member of the Board of Directors of New York Women in Film and Television, and um, also a member of New York Women in Film and Television. Absolutely. So. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to be here to um, introduce you to one of the amazing filmmakers of this film. Was this film amazing or what? <laughs> or what? I mean... I, I was just thinking when I was watching, I think this is about the third or fourth time I've seen the film, and it's like a good book. It's like something you always want to come back to and that you always get something from when you go back to it. It's really, Sabrina, it's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, let me just introduce Sabrina with a few words. She makes documentary films that explore social justice issues, the arts, and politics. She produced and edited the acclaimed documentaries Hip Hop, Beyond Beats and Rhymes, about manhood and gender politics in hip hop, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was broadcast on Independent Lens, as well as documented the story of Jose Antonio Vargas, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who outed himself as an undocumented immigrant and today fights for immigration reform. She's also a contributing editor on several documentaries, just to name a few, The New Black, Yoruba Richens, Wilhelmina's War, June Cross, who is here somewhere. And she is also, in her spare time, the co-director of the Black Documentary Collective, Sabrina. Thank you. So we really want this to be um, interactive, so I'm not gonna talk too much, because I, I could, but I won't. Um, 
But I do want to ask two questions, which I know you probably get these questions all the time in, in your Q and A's. But um, you know, this was a, a co-direction with three women, three women directors, all of whom were very well versed in their own right: uh, Barbara, Janet, and Sabrina. How did you make that work? <laughs> Uh, you know, actually, it wasn't that difficult, in part because um, Barbara, Janet, and I had worked together before, and that was actually what inspired us to say, well, let's collaborate again, because that collaboration had gone so so well. We had worked together on a documentary called Mrs. Gundo's Daughter, which is about a woman fighting for asylum to protect her daughter from uh, ritual genital cutting in Mali. Um, and I had met Barbara, I was showing uh, Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes at, at a film festival in Switzerland, I think it was. And she had approached me and asked me if I would be interested maybe in collaborating on this um, project. And so we met uh, once we were back in the States and so on, and we began what has been like a pretty long sort of like collaborative um, relationship. So it actually wasn't very difficult in the sense that it was very democratic, you know. Um, it was sometimes interesting, you know, Barbara and Janet worked together, they were a, a producing, directing team, so I was sort of like the third person sort of let, let in, so it's sometimes interesting watching their dynamic like <laughs> back and forth. And then, um, sometimes I would be, I guess, sort of like a tiebreaker, I suppose, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, it was very, I mean, it was just very open and there was like no sort of like, um, Everyone was just interested in like the best possible thing. I mean, it, as ev everyone always is, but there was no like, if you know, if you have a better idea than someone else, uh, whatever, we we're just good with that. I, I and, and did anyone have a particular uh, skill in dealing with Sonia? Because I'm sure she was a handful. <laughs> Well, you know, what's interesting is, and I should probably contextualize, I co-directed the film, but I was also um, uh, the editor of the film, so I have sort of like a different relationship to the material. But in terms of handling um, Sonia, she wasn't. Act she was actually very low maintenance. Wow. You know, I think if anything, she likes to talk. So sometimes I remember when I was editing, and I'm looking for any shot where she's just like chilling, like she's just <laughs> like, you know, relaxing and not. To, and so even like we would have like we shot a scene of her like cooking and stuff, you know, because her diet and all of that stuff is kind of really important to her invariably she starts talking <laughs> and then or then she'll start singing and then she likes it was just really funny that she just really likes um she you know she likes to talk um she you know one thing uh, um, in terms of like um uh that i was very surprised by was um you know as editor of the film i cut her poetry pretty drastically um, and I was always really anxious about the first time she would see the poetry, the, the cut, and seeing like how I had cut it down and the context in which it was used. And I always felt like, oh my God, either she'll like it or she'll just, you know, hate it, you know. But she actually had no problem with it whatsoever. She never asked me to change a thing, a thing, a thing ab around the way I presented her work. That's I would think that that would have been a surprise because someone who says that she has razor blades between her teeth, I wouldn't want to mess with her words. Right, right, right. <laughs> right exactly. I wouldn't have wanted to do that. But you know what I came to realize too, in fact, you know, on one hand I was like, oh my God, I can't believe she has taken like no issue with anything that I've done. But on the other hand, you, you realize too is that her work is so good, you know, it's so resilient. I mean, I'd really have to do, I don't know what, to like mess it, it up, up right? you know. So maybe that's why she had no anxiety about it because she knows like, you know, so it's good, you know. <laughs> and Sonia is 80. She's 81. Now? 81. And she's been going on all these um, Q and A's with you. Yeah. In fact, she's not here because she's traveling. See? Otherwise, she would she would probably be. She's here. amazing. But she's yeah, amazing. especially um, for February, which is Black History Month and Women's History Month in March, she uh, she gets a lot, a lot, a lot of requests. And um, so every single time, in fact, I've been trying to talk, I talk to her a lot on the phone and like kind of sometimes help her figure, sort out her calendar and everything. Cause a lot of people come through me to ask for her. So I end up kind of like by default doing that. And it's been so hard to like even get her on the phone because every single time I call, she's like on her way to another city. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, I just want to ask one more question then we're going to open it up to uh, the audience. So. Um, one of the things that struck me watching it this time was the comparison between Sonia being at the start of the San Francisco State Uprising in 1967 and what's going on today in New York and Philadelphia and other cities around the country. 
Has she spent much time talking about those days and comparing them to what's going on now in your off-camera conversation? Um, I don't know if she really talks about them um, in comparison. I think she also often references, uh, refers to the ways in which things are like on a sort of continuum. And um, I know she did an event, I think, with one of the fi with Alicia Garza. She's one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think people sometimes ask her about like for advice or whatever. And I think one of the things that she's really ca um, careful about doing is she's not really prescriptive. She doesn't tell people like what to do. She's like, this is your time. This is your era. This is your struggle. Like I can keep you from falling, from hurting yourself, but I'm not going to tell you like what to do. So I think. Um, but she has obviously like a s strong sense of history. I mean, one of the things that um, she said to me, um, and I mentioned this in like maybe another interview, so you may have heard this before if you saw it, it on TV or whatever, but um, she talks about like why she agreed to make the film. And one of the things I remember sh uh, she said to me was that she wants to tell her story for all of the activists, particularly the women who will not get to tell their story, whose lives and careers were pretty, um, you know, were affected in such a way that, you know, they haven't really fully recovered from those times. So she wants to, like, have on record, like, some record of that story, of that struggle for all the people who don't have the luxury that she has to, to and the platform to tell it. Have their voices heard. Yeah. I'm sh and I'm sure she had been approached by many people about having a film done about her before. Yeah, and actually there has been, there, um, Jamal Joseph, um, I don't know if you, he's um, a filmmaker, former Black, teaches a former Black Panther and teaches at Columbia. He made a film about her a few years ago and he was actually very helpful to me while um, uh, making the film. He's like, there can never be enough films about Sonia. So it was like no, you know, like sort of competitive thing or anything like that. And I think actually that's one of the challenges that um, there's a lot of footage of Sonia out there, like even if it's not, you know, there's a film about her, but also she's done like interviews and stuff like that over the years. So one of the challenges in terms of presenting her was to try to think about a way to sort of re, like to introduce her in a way and to present her in a way that you haven't already seen. So that was one of the reasons why, you know, I felt very strongly about opening the film with her writing. I feel like that's like one part of her, um, of her identity like you no one's ever had access to before like no one's ever seen her like in process and i just think it's like interesting too as an artist to be able to have like sort of like this this look into like how they do what they do and she's writing and that was her just really writing and talking to herself and making those strange Singing. noises yeah. and <laughs> doing all that like that's how she writes and i felt that by kind of opening the film with that it sort of sets up sort of like a different orientation to her like from the beginning and I, and, and setting her up first and foremost as an artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, well you did it so incredibly well, Sabrina, absolutely. I mean, I don't think we, I don't think, and I also think that the film that you and Barbara and Janet made is a very different film from what Jamal made because you can tell that you as women have given her a license and a, and a space to tell her story that she probably wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to to otherwise, I truly believe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions. We have some uh, young women with mics, Annie and Jamir, I believe. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Here's one right here. Raise your hand high, you can't see. Can we put some more light on? Because we can't see each other too well. Um, hello, I just totally love, 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 yeah. love the documentary. Oh. Um, and as a black woman, it just, it's just nice to actually see um, someone who's been there from many, many years ago fighting for, you know, black rights, but also for women's rights. Even when she became a part of Nation of Islam, I thought that was very intriguing. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, what is, um, what is the, I guess, the most important piece of advice or of you got him for Sonia or her life that, I mean, you're just with her all day, every day. This is such an intensive thing about her life. What is the most important, significant piece you got from it? Oh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if I could speak to a specific piece of advice, but it's interesting when you say I was with her all day, every day. I mean, when you're making a film, not really, but as the editor, I am with her all day, every day, listening to her, and she's talking to me, like, you know, all the time. And I think what I came away with is that, I mean, she's just a really, I mean, obviously she's a remarkable person who basically made other people 
the priority in her life. Do you know what I mean? That I think she's put like the struggle and her politics and her commitment to work ahead of everything else. So one of the things that I think I learned from 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 her is that you know, the work that she did, especially because the way in which, I don't know, to me, the way she presents herself, she's very strong, she's very capable, she's very, so like you almost can forget, you could almost think like it was really easy. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't, like it cost her a lot to do the, to do what she did. So that's one thing that I learned. And then also just in like my interaction like with her, like even now, like now that the film is done, I mean, she's, she's working like all the time or like even if she's not working she's present and like on it like all the time so she's like tireless she um she really is like her life is sort of like a demonstration of what sort of like a relentless kind of dedication looks like you know so you almost feel silly saying that you're tired around her like kind of like what Jessica like alludes yeah. to in the uh, in, in the credits because she's just relentless and she's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly generous, which isn't to say that she won't correct you, whatever, but will do so with love and <laughs> things like that. And, um, but she's really generous, really thoughtful, and just like committed in a way like I've, I don't think I've ever seen like firsthand like that, I guess, you know, in ter especially in like in this very particular way. Yes, over there. Gentlemen, mm-hmm. Congratulations on the on the film. It's it looks so it's so well done, but it looks so uh, low budget as well. So th this must be amazing on your part to to achieve that. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> probably it's because the the story and how it's told is so compelling. So congratulations on that. I wanted to touch uh, on um, on three axes. Like uh, she talked at one point about. Uh, marching, fighting, and education as the three, the three major avenues through which resistance happens. And it looks like she was at odds with her father, who was, I guess, a more bigger proponent of doing it through education. She tried to do all three, I guess, right? But then at the end, it looks like she goes into peace. Do you think that she, at the end, she has a reflecting on her life, she has a preference towards one of the three avenues through which to do um, social justice, education, fighting, or marching. Thank you. Okay. Well, actually, the three rails, I think, that, that was actually referred to by Louis Messiah, who was interviewed, who was talking ab um, about movement building, like, I think, just in general. Um, and in regard to her father, I mean, I think the relationship was actually kind of very typical parent-child where you just want to see your kids safe and out of trouble and just not, you know. So I don't even know. I think she, he wanted her to be I in a education, not so much as like a strategic kind of political choice as more like this is like safe and I know where like my daughter will have like a salary. And That's what women and could do then. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and I think, you know, Sonia says it herself that, you know, she's evolved you know, over the course of her life. She had a certain kind of sensibility. Like, in fact, you know, one of the things that I, one of the parts of, uh, that I personally like, Brian Bain is also, uh, who performs some of her poetry, is also a friend of mine. I remember we had a lot of fun when he was reading, like, some of her younger stuff. Like, you know, it's almost like, I mean, funny in the sense, like, you can't believe that this is the same woman that, you know, wrote, like, all, you know, this sort of, like, fuck you, the, you know, whatever. It's just like, oh, my God, Sonia, really? <laughs> and, um... It's actually interestingly in terms of like my introduction to Sonia is actually how I discovered her. I had, I was like, I think in maybe seventh grade and I stumbled on a collection of poems and what struck me is like, I was just really struck by what I was reading. I was like, oh my God, like I didn't know people said stuff like this. And what was really interesting is that like, it's like at an age where you're thinking about the world around you and you're, and then someone suddenly is giving voice to the very things that you're thinking about in a certain kind of way that almost gives you a little permission and um, agency. But anyway, but to get to you back to your thing, I think it's just really about an evolution and that this is like where she's come and in a way that actually makes sense. I mean, the transition from like, you know, the um, uh, demonstrating against the Iraq war and now really focusing around peace movements. I mean, I think this makes sense. I don't think there's, as someone said, it's not less fire in her, I just think it's, just a worldview that evolved opened up, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question over here, yes. Um, where are we? Oh, here we go. Lady with the glasses right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, I'm a child of the 60s. I went through some of that, but from a very different perspective than Sonia. And I found it just fascinating uh, to see another side of that whole era that I experienced from one point of view. Um, and I think you did a wonderful job, so thank you. Thank you. I have a question, though. I, I was sort of drawn in about her daughter and, the, and her children, and we don't see very much of that. We see one of her sons that she obviously still has a relationship with. Um, can you tell us any more about, does she have a relationship with her daughter? With, what about the other son? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, she has a relationship with all three of her children, so let me just say that so that there's no like anxiety around that. However, I think that's interesting. I mean, she did lose custody of her daughter as a result of her work, getting back to a previous question about like what this kind of work costs you. Um, her daughter um, lives in California, so I think there's already just sort of like a natural like distance. I don't think they see each other, obviously not on a regular um, basis, but she lives in California. I think she's a nurse and she has kids, and so, um, and then the, the these um, Marani's twin Mungu, um, also they have a relationship. Sometimes when I'm trying to track Sonia down, I'll call either one of them to try and help me um, get in touch with her. But I would say the one that you see in the film is the one I would say is like closest to her and almost is kind of like, you know, I I, I think on a day to day like really is there for his mom and 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 helps her and and um, the person with whom I had the most um, uh, contact. But you know. Again, she she has a relationship with all of them, but at the end of the day, the one who like made the commitment to be in the film and so on is Marani. You know, Mangu doesn't live in Philadelphia, so that was also part of it. He wasn't like nearby all the time, but you know, I can't really, I don't want to speak for him, but like Marani is the one who like I see consistently, and he's the one who's in the film. So we're here on this side, right here, gentleman with the baseball. Hat. All right, good afternoon. My name is Mikey J. Um, first, I want to congratulate you on your um, accolades and your film history. Um, second off, I don't feel it was low budget at all. <laughs> I think Thank it was you. shot very, very nicely. Thank you. The editing was very smooth, and the cinematography was great. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. Congrats to you. Thank you. Um, I want to know, is Sonia still heavily involved in the civil rights and um, activism and, and so forth, and how can uh, my organization as well become attached to everything that she's doing? Well, what is your organization? Um, Dynamic Artists for Peace. Um, oh, well, maybe we we'll talk after after the Q and A or whatever. Um, but you know, as I, I alluded to before, like I mean, she's still speaking, she's still performing. So she yeah, she's very much like you know like active. You know what I mean? And as I said, she had maybe it was about a year or so ago. She. Um, uh, she did this event with Alicia Garza, one of the founders of uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, so she's definitely very much engaged, and you know she does speak a lot to you know she goes on college campuses to speak precisely to young folks who are you know at that juncture in their lives and in and, and that space in terms of like their political activism. So I would say that she's very much involved. I think in terms of like you know her day to day, like I said, you know as the film alludes to, she's very much involved in the peace movement in Philadelphia in particular, and it was very much part of that mural, peace mural project. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, she's in the, she's, she's in the mix, like, you know. I love the grannies for peace. I just thought yeah. the grannies were, <laughs> the grannies were too much. Yes, we have time for like one or two more questions. Um, why don't we have this gentleman in the orange, and then we'll take one over here. Oh gosh. Okay, three quick ones, quick. Oh, okay, this is a quick question. I'm sorry, I'm a little hoarse, but um, I just wanted to know the creative process be behind creating the title, um, Bad Sonia Sanchez. Oh, that was a, I, that's a quick uh, answer. I mean, it took us a while to come to it, but it's from one of her books, We Are Bad People, and she spells bad that way. So that's sort of like an, a, a kind of wink to her work, to the way she uses language, and it seemed like the appropriate, and it was like something that I feel like captures who she is without kind of reducing her to any like, you know, one thing, so that's where that came from. It came from a title of her book. Yeah. Thank you. We get. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the editing policy. I, I think even that people are like, "What's wrong with you?" But I thought that was just so extraordinary of having this be a uh, a movie about a woman, a documentary about a woman who had three children, and that was maybe about five 
to 7% of the film. And her as a mother was important and powerful, and yet it was not what the story you were telling was about. And so I'm curious, was that a decision made beforehand? Was that a decision made in editing? And even the balance of the stuff about the civil rights movement and the women's, the awareness of, of, of the women, and w were all these balances made before or were they made? I did them all in the editing I, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I knew you were the one to ask about them. Yeah, I'm, you know, um, well, it actually does speak to like one of the challenges of editing the film is like, again, like what I had mentioned before that like there's a lot of footage of Sonia out there. So one of my challenges I felt uh, editing the film is how to present her in a way that doesn't feel like it just reinscribes like what we already feel we already know about Sonia. So I didn't want to be like, and also I didn't want to be stuck in this like very chronological telling. I mean, obviously it's generally chronological, but like I wanted to be able to kind of like move in and out of that. So I didn't want to do like once upon a time she was born here, no. nor did I want to say she you kind of go into like her activism because I think that's what people s most strongly associate her with. So that um, I think the decision to have, um, which was made beforehand to have people read her poetry was really opened up possibility structurally because rather than have any of these one things about Sonia like inform the, st the progression of the story, I could go in and out of her story using the poetry yeah. as a way to take me. So it kind of freed me from this sort of like very um, chronological or linear telling. And as I did that, it just didn't feel like I, the um, kids come up at the when they come up, like you know, in the in the over the course of telling this story, you know, and I think it also again speaks to, like, the ways in which she organized her life. So it's not like this, like, you know, it's flu. It's like a little more fluid. So so um, without being facetious, but yeah, that was sort of like the idea to kind of like find some way to get out of find a new way to tell her story, so you don't feel like you've heard this before, or you've seen this before. Um, and I think, again, people performing the poetry really opened things up and, and had the added benefit of like, if you don't know her work, you got to discover Absolutely. it or rediscover it. No, and I think Sonia does say at one point that how the, um, the introduction of black studies into a curriculum led to the other studies happening, yes. following, right. which is exactly how it happened in the movement as well. Right. Okay, in the back, because I promised. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had heard about Sonia Sanchez through her, like her words and her work. I didn't know much about the social activism, so I thank oh. you for your film. That really uh, showed a lot. My question is, what is she, which was a question that I had as watching and I didn't, there wasn't an answer. What is her view and now your view since you edited and you're part of the filmmaking process on the redundancy of the struggle that she had to pass 60 years ago and it's still going on? And you're, because obviously you're much younger than Sonia, so w how, did it inspire you? Do you feel some, like, maybe anger isn't the right word, but frustration over seeing the right. same thing keep happening and we haven't moved as a country, as a nation, as a people right. together? Right, well, no, I understand. Um, I mean, there's a, there's, on one hand, there is, there is something like really sad, like even you see, like I, I can't remember who did it, but they put side by side to um, like a headline from 1965 yeah. and one yeah. today, and you wouldn't know which was which. And then even when I was editing, there's that scene with the demonstrations and you have people holding up signs about police brutality, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And every time I look at that, it kind of like affects me. Even though I, like, I cut it, but it still like kind of affects me a certain way because I feel like I was in a demonstration like that in New York like just a year ago or like whatever, you know? Um, and it's just really remarkable. Like when you see something like that, it almost makes you feel like nothing has changed. I think that's not entirely true but it does certainly like feel that way when you put juxtapose things um there's like there's um the way i think about it is i, I can't and i'm paraphrasing but the aclu like i think like their exp their motto is like freedom that cannot protect itself meaning that it's not as if like you struggle for something and then you win it and then it's done and then you go home and then that's over it's like you are always having to sort of like fight for certain rights fight for certain freedom because there's always you know, there's always people who are wanting to oppress folks for whatever reason and are always finding new ways. So on one hand, you fight for, for the right to vote, like 
40 years ago or 50 years ago, and then here you are like fighting for it again because uh, between redistricting and, and, and voter um, ID laws or whatever, or finding like this other way around to do the very same thing. So you can't ever, it's a reminder that you can't just sort of lay, on, you know, just sleep and just think that like everything's gonna be fine. And I think the reason why things emerge over time is like there's always like these periods where we think like everything's cool and then we realize like, oh no, they're not. And then so what it feels like it's a new movement, but it's really a continuation of a struggle that I don't think necessarily ends or you don't put a period on it. You always have to sort of like, if you look at it like in a macro sense in terms of freedom and dignity and justice, you never stop s taking a stand for it or you shouldn't, otherwise you end up in these. Places. And I think, yes, that was well, well put to me. Very well put. And I think just to your point as well, there's multiple generations of people who don't have this history as their firsthand knowledge. So to have a documentary like this to incorporate uh, the story of this amazing woman, this talent, into the, the canons of our history, of our struggle, is really critical. And it's really critical, I think, for us to make sure young people see this film mm -hmm. because they surely don't have this. But as this young lady in the back said, there's also other generations in between that don't have this information. And so that makes your film, Sabrina and Barbara and Janet, that much more important and such an honor. And I'm so glad that you, you were the one who did it. You were the one who Thank did you. it. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And we have a lovely reception waiting for us outside where you can talk to Sabrina more closely. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you to all the organizations put this together. We know it's a lot of work. And, and can you. I say, if you took pictures, because I don't have anybody here with me, can you come to me and I'll give you my email? You can send them to me. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we you. got you covered.